All right, Jen Bioworks. This is going to be an introduction and instructions for exercise 10, human evolution, specifically for procedure two in your lab manual. So just as a review for the goals for today's lab, overall, um, we would like you to compare and contrast anagenesis and platogenesis, explain how comparative morphology and fossils can be used to examine evolution in general, We'd like you to be able to describe the geologic time scale. We also would like you to be able to explain how important discoveries of human fossils have helped scientists develop the current views on human evolution. We're gonna have you take measurements on skulls and various parts of skulls that are important in anthropological investigation. You're going to derive and examine a graph and use it to explain evolutionary trends and then synthesize information from fossil skulls and use it to infer about human evolution. So now that you've explored the probable chronology of these skulls, here's the proper chronology or organized from the most ancient as being the B skull and the most modern as the I skull. And if you haven't already read the reference material that's on pages 137 to 141 in your lab manual, please read about each of these skulls that you've been working with. Um, it will help you gain a better understanding of the natural history of these specimens and will help you um, as we move forward. So if you haven't done so already, please read pages 137 to 141. So today for procedure two, essentially the goals um, for this portion of the lab is to have you fill out table 10.2 in your lab report. And this includes measuring skull characteristics so that we can determine how different the skulls of these species are. And then ultimately, this is going to help us answer the overall question of does human evolution follow a pattern explained by anagenesis solely or by cladogenesis? So the next step in this lab is to make measurements of skull images using an open source imaging software called ImageJ. Um, and using ImageJ, we're able to take measurements of images that we upload. Um, and we're going to review the information in your lab manual on pages 138 to 140 that explains how to take these measurements. And we'll also review the evolutionary basis for some of these traits. So why are we taking some of these measurements? So the first measurement that you are going to be taking is cranial projection. So generally speaking, a larger cranial projection indicates a more developed frontal lobe which is the portion of the brain that is responsible for reasoning, problem solving, planning, emotion. And you can see here, I have some lines on the skulls. Essentially, cranial projection is this, this space in between here. Um, and I'll explain next how we measure that. Um, so in order to measure cranial projection, we actually use a side view of the skull. So you can see I have a side view of the skull here. And we measure the distance between the top of the skull and the top of that superorbital brow ridge. So I've pointed that out right here with this arrow. Your superorbital brow ridge is kind of the top of your eyebrows. It's kind of that quintessential characteristic that Neanderthal uh, skulls and reanimations have. So you can just put, um, you can measure this distance between here, and this is going to be your cranial projection. And as I mentioned before, you, um, a larger cranial projection generally means that you have a larger frontal lobe and therefore you're able to um, problem solve better. Maybe you have more emotion than some organisms that have a smaller cranial projection. The next trait that you're going to be measuring is going to be facial projection. So a flatter face is actually a lot better for an upright posture and it allows for a larger cranium, which uh, therefore corresponds with a larger brain. So organisms that have a smaller facial projection probably had more upright posture and larger brains. And to measure facial projection, what we do is we use a side view image of the skull. So you can see I have my skull of interest here with my side view. And we measure the difference between that superorbital brow ridge that I mentioned and the front of the upper jaw. Now, you don't have to include the incisors if they bow out a little bit. It's just where that upper jaw ends, that bone right there. And you can measure that distance between the two, and this is going to be your facial projection. And as I mentioned, flatter faces probably um, were a lot better for upright posture and allowed for larger craniums um, and therefore larger brains. 
So the next trait that we're going to be looking at is face width. And the way that we calculate um, th this trait is actually has to do with the percentage of masseter muscles compared with the overall width of the face. So we're not just measuring the width of the face, we're measuring the percentage of these masseter muscles. And the masseter muscles determine jaw strength. So our masseter muscles kind of start at the jaw here and they go under a layer of bone known as the zygomatic arch, which you'll be learning a little bit about in your lab manual and they insert at the upper part of your head at the top of the skull. And so by calculating the percentage of masseter muscles to, um, compared to the overall width of the face, we actually have a proxy then for jaw strength. Um, so one of the things that you can think about with face width is potentially the kind of diet that um, you might have given a different face width. So um, there are some diets that require a lot of jaw strength. And what can that tell you about the skull that you're looking at? So you can compare this modern human skull with this mountain lion skull. And what we've done is we are comparing the ratio of D, which is the measurement between the inner of the zygomatic arches, and C, which is the measurement of the outer portions of the zygomatic arches. And um, this ratio tells us that uh, this ratio tells us kind of how much jaw strength that organism had. So you can see here that the mountain lion skull probably had a um, larger amount of masseter muscles um, compared to the overall width of the skull. And that makes sense because when you think about the diets that a human ate or eats compared to the diet that a mountain lion eats, a mountain lion is going to be eating a lot more um, they're, they're strictly carnivorous, so they're going to be feeding on strictly meat and need a lot of musculature to take down their prey and tear their flesh. So more specifically to measure face width, as I kind of mentioned, we measure this distance between the inside of the zygomatic arch here, which we call D, and your lab manual also refers to as D. And we compare that with the measurement between the outer edges of the zygomatic arches, which we refer to as C. We take this ratio and we multiply it by 100, and that gives us that percentage of masseter muscles compared with the overall face width. So a larger percentage of masseter muscles compared to the face width probably means that you are eating vastly different foods than an organism that has a smaller ratio of masseter muscles to face width. So the next trait that we're looking at is cranial size. So by measuring cranial size, we are actually measuring a proxy for brain size. So you can see in this image, organisms that have larger cranials actually can support larger brains compared to organisms that have smaller cranials. And to measure this, we actually can form the brain into what is called an ellipsoid. So you'll use the ellipsoid tool um, in your software here and you'll make, we'll use two different views. So we will use um, our side view and our top view. And you'll wanna make your ellipsoid and determine the horizontal and vertical radii here, which we have labeled A and B. Your lab manual also refers to them as A and B. And then with your top view, you want to find your horizontal and vertical radii as well. And what you're really in, um, looking for here in the top view is this C measurement. And so with our A, B, and C measurements, we can use this equation, 4 thirds pi times ABC, to calculate the cranial size. So a larger cranial size probably means that you had a larger brain. The next trait that you are going to be looking at is going to be the foramen magnum. So the foramen magnum is a hole that's at the bottom of the skull where the spinal cord enters and where the vertebrae attach to the skull. So here we actually have the base of the skull completely cut out in this image. We're just looking at um, or the top of the skull, I'm sorry, cut out in this image, and we're just looking at the foramen magnum to give you an idea of where it is. So the location of the foramen magnum is heavily influenced by an organism's posture and whether or not they are bipedal or quadrupedal. So when you're comparing maybe an early hominid to um, a dog, where would you think that their foramen magnums would be in their skulls comparing these two organisms? I'll give you a minute to brainstorm that. 
So if you guessed that the human skull probably had a foramen magnum that extends out the bottom, you are correct. So since humans are bipedal, so they walk and stand in an upright position, their foramen magnum extends out the bottom of their skull, which allows for their spinal cord to extend vertically down, whereas dogs, which um, are domesticated from wolves, walk on all four limbs. Therefore, their foramen magnum would extend out the back of their skull, allowing for their spinal cord to extend horizontally. So bipedal organisms typically have their foramen magnum positioned just past the center of their skull. And we're gonna be looking at that in a little bit more detail. So in order to calculate this measurement um, with relation to where the foramen magnum is um, compared to the rest of the skull, we're going to measure the distance from the back of the skull all the way to the front of the skull, and we'll call this measurement A. And then we're going to measure from the middle of the foramen magnum to the front of the skull, and we'll call this measurement B. And then we divide the lengths of B and A and multiply them by 100, so that gives us a percentage of where that foramen magnum falls on the skull. So organisms, organisms with the foramen magnum just larger than 50%, means that the foramen magnum is just past the middle of the skull and they are likely to have walked upright or bipedally. Now if you have a measurement for the foramen magnum um, here that we calculate that's a lot larger than 50 percent, then that means that this foramen magnum is going to be pushed way back towards the end of the skull. Um, so it probably is actually extending out the back and that organism is probably not bipedal, therefore probably quadrupedal. So just to review some of the um, traits that we went over today and what the measurements mean, whether they're larger or smaller, I'll go over this chart, but feel free to use this as a reference as you're moving through your lab manual. So for cranial projection, remember that has to do with um, your frontal lobe. So if you have a larger cranial projection, then you probably have a more developed frontal lobe, you're more able to problem solve, maybe you have more emotional capacity than a an organism that has a smaller cranial projection. Um, and those that have a smaller cranial projection have a less developed frontal lobe, which in turn um, leads to less ability to problem solve, less emotional capacity. So for facial projection, that's the flatness of the face. When we have a larger facial projection, we have a more elongate fa elongated face and a smaller cranium and most likely not an upright posture, which in turn, if we have a smaller facial projection, we probably have a flatter face. We have a larger cranium and probably a more upright posture. Now with regards to face width, face width is that uh, measurement that has to do with the masseter muscles and jaw strength. So if you have more mass, if you have a larger face width measurement from this lab, you probably have more masseter muscles relative to your face width and therefore you have more jaw strength. So think about what that means in terms of diet. If you have a smaller face width measurement, you probably have less masseter muscles relative to your face width and therefore less jaw strength. With regards to cranial size, um, if you have a larger cranial size, you probably can support a larger brain. Whereas if you have a smaller cranial size, you probably have a smaller brain. Now, form and magnum is a little bit confusing in this chart, only because we don't really think of the measurements as larger or smaller, but more close to 50 or uh, further away from 50, 50% 50 that is, 50% um, the length of the skull. So if your form and magnum is placed much further than 50%, the length of your skull, then that form and magnum is probably almost extending, almost or is extending out the back of the skull. And therefore, that organism is probably going to be quadrupedal compared to if your foramen magnum measurement is close or just over 50%, that means that your foramen magnum is just past the midline of that skull. Therefore, you're probably walking upright and you're probably a bipedal organism. So you're probably wondering what you are going to be doing with all of this information. So you're actually going to be using the Homo erectus skull images on Canvas, which are labeled as HE, and they include a ruler in the image um, and once you go through the image J tutorial, this will make sense to you. You want the images to include a ruler um, because you're going to be taking actual measurements of them and you need a reference for that. So you're going to complete these measurements that I just went over and you're going to um, fill out table 10.2 in your lab manual. And after you've completed this section, you can actually move on to the instructions and materials for procedure three.
And in order to download ImageJ, as I mentioned, it is a free open source software. So the link to the tutorial is here. Um, you uh, can download it on any computer, that, uh, any program software that you have, if you have Mac, Linux, or Windows, um, and you can move forward through the lab from there. So thank you for watching and good luck measuring your skulls. <laughs>